Okay, we're back. We're live. I'm Jay Fidel. Happy to be here at ThinkTech. And we're talking about community matters. And one of the matters we'd like to talk about is, um, you know, decency. <laughs> Let's call it that. And today we're going to talk about the gender gap in America <coughs> and how it is growing with Brad Coates. Brad Coates is a lawyer, but he's also a philosopher. And he's also kind of a social analyst, if you will. Um, and he's here with us now. And so is his book. Uh, so, Brad, welcome to the show, as, as always. Good to be back, Jay. And the book, now the book is called um, the... Mm, oh, Divorce with Decency. Divorce with Decency. And I was thinking, it's a great book. We talked about it before. And there's so much that you need to learn, that you do learn, in, in looking at divorce um, with, you know, described by decency. But, you know, what about life with decency, you know? Divorce with decency, life with decency. I mean, don't you think the human condition would be better for all 8 billion of us if, if we were just decent all day? We tried hard. I don't think decent. anybody would argue with that. Yeah. But uh, my focus has been mainly on relationships. Uh, started out, you know, being a divorce lawyer and, and focusing on, you know, what the causes of divorce were. And I've rewritten this book about five different times. And each time, it seems to be getting more and more clear that what's actually happening is that there's a, a growing gender gap between men and women in society, and that, I think, is contributing to the divorce. I mean, the divorce rate. There's all kinds of other factors, of course. Oh, but, okay. Well, that's the title of our show, The Gender Gap. Imagine that. That's growing. But let me unpack that a little bit with you. What do you mean gender gap? Is there a gap? Two, uh, what is it, uh, something, vive la différence? You know, French is uh, uh, de rigueur this week in view of, of Notre Dame. Uh, vive la différence. What, what is the gender gap? Anyway. Well, it, the gender gap as pertains to marriage, again, it used to be that the surest way to financial security for women was a marriage to a potentially wealthier guy. Women were, you know, at home, at home being homemakers. The guy was bringing home the, the paycheck. Uh, you know, you, you, he was the one who had basically almost all the money, and, uh, and the more successful the male was, the more successful the marriage was, maybe. Mm -hmm. Now, women are more successful than men an awful lot of the time, and that has been a relatively, relatively recent shift. Well, and, I, I, re I recall uh, Leave it to Beaver in the, in the uh, 50s, you remember that? And uh, all the, you know, the, uh, the public um, view of marriage was the white picket fence, and it was the woman staying home and tending to the cooking and the cleaning and the children. And the man goes off warrior style and, and makes a living and brings home a paycheck. Yeah, and, exactly. And, and so many families that I knew in those days, the woman would never have thought about working, ever. Um, and, but at the same time, she was, you know, under the thumb. That's too strong a term. But she was mm, submissive and the husband was... Dominant. Well, women are no longer submissive. No. Uh, that's, that's for sure. I, let, me, let me just give you some statistics about how, how dramatically this has changed. I'm going to read them off my, my crib sheet because what's happened now is that, the, you know, this is really the roots of feminism, is that women are now much less dependent upon men, certainly economically. Nowadays, many women marry men who have less education and lower earning power than they did. In 1960, 32% of wives worked. In, in 2008, it was 60, 61%. Wife is now the main breadwinner in over 25% of all U.S. households. That was 7% in 1970. Almost 60% of all bachelors and higher degrees, more than half, are now earned by women. One-third of married wives are now better educated than their husband. One-third of all small, all small U.S. businesses are now female-owned. California just had a passed a new statute that requires female, uh, minimum numbers of females on boards of directors for major companies. Um, it's getting to be, you know, you had the largest number of women ever in U.S. history, 102 uh, women elected to the U.S. House of Representatives in last, in last year's election. So this is, a, this is a major and significant change. Is this all out of Gloria Steinem? I mean, what happened here? This is women's rights, women's lib, if you will. That, that goes it's, back to Well, it's the, the extrapolation anyway. of that, for yeah. sure. I mean, you know, depending on where you want to carry it back to, it may be all out of the birth control pill. I mean, it used to be that women were getting pregnant every time they had sex. Not every time, but often they'd have sex and be pregnant. That would take them out of the working world. Child, listen to this. Childbearing has been reduced from being the primary activity in a female's life cycle to now being only one of several activities that she does. Before, conceiving and child rearing occupied half of a woman's life cycle. 
now it's down, down to about, uh, about 10%. Why is that? Women are having fewer kids, so there are not as many of them replicating. And there's better child care services available. There's right. all kinds. So women, that, to help you, women right? that used to have to be out of the labor force just for child rearing alone now can come back into it. And it turns out they're smarter and getting more degrees and out earning guys a lot of the time. And, and at the same time, men are getting weaker. So that's, so that's okay. kind of a bizarre well, phenomenon, too. how about the too. Me Too thing? The Me Too thing is two years old now. Funny, it came up just around the time that Trump was uh, elected. Yeah, not um, that funny. <laughs> not that big a not coincidence. That Sorry, yeah. not that funny. And certainly uh, not a coincidence. Um, no. Uh, so, so here we have the Me Too thing. It has gone in every direction, including don't, don't, even, don't even touch me uh, in an affectionate way. Um, and um, that has somehow changed and catapulted us all into a new view of the relationship between men and women, at least in public and, I suppose, in private. Oh, totally. I mean, it certainly has expanded the concept of the sisterhood, standing up for one another. I mean, you know, after the Kavanaugh hearings, the number of, of hotline abuse calls, domestic violence calls, exploded. Women who have previously hadn't wanted to talk about it, you know, f felt like yeah, they had a good that. support yeah, system yeah. to talk about it. Yeah. So you have, uh, you know, our, our very own S Senator Maisie Hirono, who I like and respect in many other ways, uh, you know, we're basically calling men misogynists and, uh, and telling men to stand up and shut up. That was, I think, her famous quote. I, you know, that triggered a counter-reaction on behalf of men to the term that I'd never even heard before, misandry, which is a misandry is when women hate men. Never yeah. heard of, never heard yeah, of I, I know, it's always been misogyny, but, <laughs> yeah. but misandry is now, you know, women who hate men. And uh, so, you know, it, it just all that stuff tends to, to further to divide. Well, it certainly hasn't come to rest, has it? I mean, it's in full play. Um, people are, may I use the term divisive? You know, we have a lot of divisiveness in this country, and I think divisive seems to apply to the, the gender gap, too. You know? Oh, totally. I've never seen the country more divided, and it's, and it's really, a, you know, it, it's a real problem, especially between genders. I mean, how, if there is this instinctive gap, between, or a growing gap between men and women, you know, it's going to impact how, how you can hold marriages together, or whether people are even going to get married at all. Because now, marriage oftentimes met, it has been shown now that men benefit more from marriage than women do. I started by saying it used to be that well, this, was a, this was a surefire route to success for women. Now, there are many, many, you know, I don't know if you'd call them slacker guys. I mean, they're, they're guys have, have kind of, you know, the alcoholism, uh, video game addiction, the opioid crisis. That's mainly a pornography addiction. Those are mainly male, you know, habits, not some of their better habits. Uh, you know, women certainly, uh, you know, in their college years, they you know, maybe drink too much and go on spring break and get into wet t-shirt contests and stuff like that. But women immediately start to change around. They get much more serious about life quickly, usually by their late 20s. You know, it's okay if I'm going to, now if I'm going to get married, if I'm going to have a kid, I want a house, a you know, roof over the kid's house. I got to start saving for private school tuition, especially here in Hawaii. Um, you know, women start getting a serious to-do list going and guys are still partying. Yeah, and that, and that changes the relationship in dating, uh, in marriage, uh, and in the office place, and I suppose in divorce as well. Um, you, you know, the, the old thing about male dominance is really... The old thing. The, the old thing, that doesn't really work anymore, <laughs> yeah. at least not in most of the country anyway. So this, this is a, a huge social change what you're talking about. Yeah, it really is. Like I say, women getting stronger, men getting weaker. Uh, you know, it's not necessarily true that women are necessarily happy about it. There, you know, it's an, you know, Maureen Dowd is a famous writer. She's talked about how did, did, did feminist, um, feminist uh, revolution wind up benefiting men more than women. And she talks about how the midlife crisis now is more, is a more of a woman's issue because now women have got all the stress of, of the life in the professional world and they're still doing most of the heavy lifting around the house. But can so we, they can, can get a little resentful about can that. Can we come to rest on this? Isn't, you know... We're st as I say, I think we're still in process. We agree on that. But take the military, okay? Um, and without getting into the LB, LB, the LBT. Les Q, yeah, right. All that. Uh, and the, and the, uh, the trans issue that Trump raised this week. Before getting to that, the question was, can we have men and women serving on the same ship, in the same unit, in the same air aircraft, in the same you know, battlefield? Can we do that? And it seems clear that we have done that. Correct. And that in, you know, in a, you know, 90%, I, that's, I'm making that up, but in a very large percentage of the units in military 
in the military world, it works. It works. The women have found a place. The men accept the women. They're equals, or so it seems. Um, and they function well together. So does that tell us something about how it should work or is working in, in the office? Well, I think that's where it's got to go. I mean, obviously, there's got to be an, an equal playing field for, you know, across the board. And that certainly will help promote the, uh, promote the likelihood that the, that the genders will get along. But again, and it's one thing to get along in a, you know, in a context of maybe an office or a, or a you know, ship, uh, you know, military unit. It's another thing to get along in, a, in, in marriages, which is, again, what I focus on, or relationships. 80% of all relationships are, are ended by women. Two-thirds of all divorce filings are started by women. What does that tell you? It means that women are unhappy more often than men are. You know, men, men will basically stay in even a bad marriage as long as they're getting fed regularly and as long as they're hopefully getting some sex but and getting whatever. And, and, uh, how how many of those are the result of the fact that the, the, the fellow goes out and plays? He's having an affair. Which a woman cannot tolerate. Women do I mean, not it's tolerate that. Sort of a that. catalytic result, catalytic yeah. reaction. In my experience, and I've handled, I don't know, thousands, tens of thousands of divorces in the Coates and Fry law firm. The, if you're going to see a divorce started by a man, it's almost always because he's got some gal on the, on, the, on the outside. And you're right, the wives don't think that's very funny at all. But that's about the only time guys will leave marriages. And how about the women? You, I mean, if, if, if a woman well, finds out that her husband is uh, having an affair, doesn't that inevitably lead, or great likelihood that will lead to a divorce? Sure. I mean, it certainly increases the likelihood. Sometimes you can work it out in counseling, whatever. But, but, the, but women will get divorced for all the, you know, what you would call the right philosophical reasons. I mean, women will get divorced for, you know, lack of communication. Now, a lot of guys don't even understand what that is. I mean, physically, women have 20,000 communication signals a day. And guys have 7,000, whether it be rolling your eyes or speaking, you know, actual spoken words or, you know, shrugging your shoulders, whatever. Women are totally tuned, turned on by and tuned into communication. And guys are not great at it. Guys are still cavemen in a lot of ways. So women get dissatisfied with that. You know, they will leave, literally leave a relationship just because a, a husband is not, you know, their dream guy anymore. Mm -hmm. Women, a guy will, like I say, as long as he's relaxed in his lazy boy lounger and getting to watch sports on TV and getting fed three meals a day, he'll stay in even a bad marriage. You know, um, this also, you know, affects um, the affair itself. A fellow who has an affair or a woman who has an affair, because that's probably part of the gender gap issue too, um, that that relationship is also affected by these changes. The relationship of the husband with an outside interest or the wife with an outside interest. That relationship is not like it used to be. It's different, right? It's hard for society to adjust to that, though. I mean, yeah, you know, that, yeah. uh, multiple partners is not something that a Western society has ever been very comfortable with. I mean, yeah. you know, certainly Muslim societies get used to it. Asian societies do, but not in the West. Well, you know, one thing that uh, strikes me is that you're talking about here in the title of the show, um, the gender gap in America is growing, which suggests that they're further apart, the male, the female, what have you, further apart. But, but isn't, I mean, economically, aren't they closer and closer? So why do we talk about growing apart when, in fact, um, you know, salaries, uh, power in the office, Oh, um, yeah, no uh, question. Uh, uh, you know, possibilities of advancement are I'm, closer. I'm, I'm talking about as, as, it, as it affects the relationship. Certainly, there. You know, the closer we come to equality, I mean, now we've got you know almost as many women in the House of Representatives as we do men, and a lot of people say it's much better to have women, you know, run companies and that they're better mediators and you know be better managing partners of law firms. I mean, all that stuff is very auspicious. The problem is, what happens when you know when the woman who's been the managing partner of the law firm and has had a very stressful day comes back home and her husband is you know underachieving you know, playing video games, watching porn, getting drunk, doing all the kind of things that guys are so great at, and making half the money she is, how long does that, you know, how long does it take before that starts affecting her dissatisfaction with the relationship? One minute. So, it takes one minute. Yeah, exactly. And that's because <laughs> we're going to have a one-minute break right now. Brad Coates, uh, matrimonial lawyer and philosopher. We'll be right back. Aloha. I'm Gwen Harris, the host here at Think Tech Hawaii a digital media company serving the people of Hawaii. We provide a video platform for citizen journalists to raise public awareness in Hawaii. We are a Hawaii nonprofit that depends on the generosity of the supporters to keep on going. 
We'd be grateful if you go to thinktechhawaii.com and make a donation to support us now. Thanks so much. <laughs> Hey, aloha. My name is Andrew Lanning. I'm the host of Security Matters Hawaii, airing every Wednesday here on Think Tech Hawaii, live from the studios. I'll bring you guests. I'll bring you information about the things in security that matter to keeping you safe, your coworkers safe, your family safe, to keep our community safe. Uh, we want to teach you about those things in our industry that, you know, may be a little outside of your experience. So please join me because security matters. Aloha. Okay. okay, we've had a minute to think about that. But you know, one thing is, you know, this discussion, this issue that you've raised, and I know you give talks about it hither and yon, it's a little scary for men, isn't it? It, it, it means is they scary no longer them. have the prerogatives they thought, maybe they thought when they were younger that they would have. You, you, listen to this. The new trend, as published in a recent article by the American Psychology Association, has described toxic masculinity as a public health crisis and recommends treatment guidelines for men and boys which effectively pathologize the male half of humanity. The report asserts that traditional masculinity marked by stoicism, competitiveness, dominance and aggression is harmful to both themselves and society, results in the oppression of women and minorities and an epidemic of violence. Oh. Telling men they need conversion therapy just for being men. That, I mean, that, you know, you know, this is, this is, I always look at, and maybe this is an inaccurate way of looking at it, look at American culture through American art, through movies, of which we are covered these days. And I, and I wonder if that's, if that's a fair way of looking at this. Because uh, do you think the movies we see, the shows we see on television, correctly inform us about these changes and about what is really happening? And, and about, for example, this uh, you know, male conduct you described, toxic, toxic male conduct. Um, is, can we learn anything from popular art? Well, it certainly seems like um, you know, the, uh, now the superheroes are women. I mean, Wonder Woman, I thought was one of the best movies I'd say out of all these superhero movies. And I guess the new Avenger movie focuses on Captain Marvel is actually a Wahini. <laughs> so, so uh, I, you know, that, you know the, the movie makers are going with this, maybe because Harvey Weinstein is not in charge of movie studios anymore. I mean, you know, the hashtag Me Too thing has, has definitely changed. I mean, it used to be that an alpha male approaching a woman in an elevator and saying, hey, that's an attractive dress or whatever, um, you know, was, you know, that, that was, that was par for the course yeah. and it was a compliment. Yeah. Now it's sexual harassment. Yeah. So this gets, this gets to be very, very serious and could get seriouser um, the more, the more. Uh, well, let's talk about that. I mean, you, 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 so it's going to get worse. Maybe, you know, anything I say can be turned the wrong way against me in the elevator or otherwise and expose me to criticism or worse um, because of the gender gap, or at least the, the sensitivity after the Weinstein change. At the very least, the genders are gonna be more on guard vis-a-vis -vis one another, on guard. Which, which may be, you know, that may be okay. It may be but okay. It, but it, it also it, does kind of mess with, you know, the Darwinian theory and thousands of years of, of you know, of, uh, you know, human history and biology. Yeah, so, how, you know, what about the old thing about male, mm, male hormones? Male, you know, need to hunt, right? And, uh, you know, be a, a warrior and come back with the beef and all that. You know, the necessary, I mean, historically necessary role of the male. Are, are we going to lose that? Uh, maybe we have to. We're going to have to neuter it to some degree. I mean, I mean men are going to have to get to be more sensitive. What women want is, is sensitive, communicative males. They don't want a big brawny come home with the, you know, kill the saber-toothed tiger at the, at, the head of the, uh, at the head of the cave type of guys anymore. Um, you know, female athletes are doing stuff that you would have never even believed anymore. I mean, I watched some of these, uh, some of these Wahine runners running a marathon, you know, five minutes slower than, than guys. Uh, you know, it's, it's, true. it's amazing. Just in Boston this week. That's right. So, you know, I just wonder, you talk about the future, and I'm interested in the future. I mean, I think we here at ThinkTech are always interested in, you know, projecting into the future. So yes, maybe it'll get more Harvey Weinstein concerned, you know, 
better be careful. Don't say anything that might offend anyone. Um, the, other, the other side of it, though, maybe there'll be, a, and you referred to this earlier, sort of a backlash. You know, right now, for example, there's an organization called Women for Energy, or Women in Energy. Wait a minute, all the energy organizations in the past have been people in energy. So now it's women in energy. Are we going to see more men in energy? Is that, is that what's going to happen? Is you know, sort of a, you know, a, a, a loop back? Or are we going to, are we going to continue to see the, um, you know, the process by which women um, uh, ascend you know, to greater influence and the men really don't celebrate their malehood? Well, I, I think the ascension of women in the Western world, anyway, is, is inevitable at this point. I don't, you know, I don't think there's any, any question about that. I mean, women are able to do stuff that guys don't seem to be able to do. And the more the paradigm shifts to, to the focus in society being on that rather than on just, I mean, nowadays, you fight a war by, by triggering a drone strike, right. uh, you know, and, 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 you know, and women can do that. Just, just as, as well. As, just better. Better. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. Not, it's not how many hands do you need to hold a bronze. Or already. information technology, computers, all these big companies, totally. they're dominant and they're very successful companies, and women can do that just as well, if not better. I think it's probably a great thing for society and for the, and for the economy. And I mean, you know, by all means, I, I love to hire women in my law firm. The problem is, you know, what it's going to do to the traditional male-female, you know, romantic relationship and marriages. I mean, 51% of all females in, in the U.S. nowadays are unmarried. They don't, they don't want to get married. They have kids out of, 50% of all kids born to women under 30 are, are out of wedlock. There's really almost no need for the and, and the world is becoming the Western world is becoming more secular and less religious, and so the religious confines that they use constraints that used to keep society you together. You don't, don't need marriage anymore. You don't need marriage it, anymore. Before it served the purpose, uh, economic primarily, but other things. Now, now you don't need it because you can get what you want without marriage. And with a longer lifespan, you know, then you've got to try and have a have a relationship that actually sticks through all that and continues to work, and that gets less and less likely because you need. Oftentimes, people need different partners for different stages of their lives. So, so marriage. I mean, there, there are. Uh, there's a guy named Charles Martel who's predicted the the end of marriage in 2000 uh, between 2028 and 2034. So this sociologist uh, Charles Martel, which uh, that ain't that long away. It's, it's, ten years. Six year span there. Yeah, yeah so, somewhere within the next ten to fifteen years, he predicts the end of marriage altogether. What do you think? I don't think it'll be you know, quite that. As, as, a, as a matrimonial lawyer, this should be of some concern to you. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. <laughs> and already we've, already we've changed our practice a lot to focus on, on paternity cases, which are you know, child-rearing cases, custody and child support for kids born out of wedlock. Uh, you Different know. issues now, yeah. Yeah, and, and domestic abuse is a huge issue nowadays. So, is it huger because of this? Well, it's certainly been, been brought more to the forefront now. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. yeah, because we're more civilized about it. The case loads, more sensitive about case it. Caseloads in those areas for a, for a matrimonial lawyer have gone up exponentially. So really what I want to get out of this here in the last few minutes of our discussion is um, some advice. Yeah. Advice to men, and for that matter, advice to women about the gender gap, how to deal with it, how to adjust your thinking about it, your worldview about it, and your day-to-day -day conduct so that you, you know, don't cross a line and, and, and uh, undermine you know, your position in the community or your relationships with people around you. What's your advice going forward, knowing all this and, and thinking about the gender gap and how it's growing? Well, there's, uh, I think women's progress, in the, at least in the Western world, is virtually unstoppable. I think you got to take that as a given. Uh, there are some there's some chemistry that might work. There's something called a vasosuppressor, which is a, a vasosuppressor, which is a bonding hormone where maybe people can you know literally take chemicals that make them be more empath empathetic and, and more emotional towards one another. Um, fixing the sexual problems would probably help, but that's something that's gotten even worse. I mean, we'd have to do a whole another show about what the impact of, of uh, instant dating, uh, uh, the uh, pornography, you know. Far more, you know, something like 60% of all males, but only about 30% of all females feel that sex is, is important to their marriage. So maybe women, you know, could, with sexual, there's, there's sex counselors, sex therapists that can maybe improve those statistics. That's actually gotten even worse. It used to be that both, gen, both genders sort of ran out of gas as far as their sexual needs sort of simultaneously as they aged. Now, men can take Viagra, so even an old fart like you could theoretically feel sexy. 
inconceivable as that may seem. Oh, oh, uh, no, you can believe that. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, so, you know, guy pops a Viagra, gets an instant erection. Now he wants to use it. Women don't want that. They want foreplay. They want kissing and touch. That's more important than the actual sex act. For guys, now they're hard and erect and they want, they want sex. It's actually, the chem and there's been no drug that makes women feel sexier that's really worked all that well. So the chemical part of this thing has actually gone kind that's of out of sync. another factor, isn't out it? Out of the, sync. The chemistry is another factor. Chemistry is out of, out of sync a little so bit. So that means in the bed, sex. in the way you conduct yourself in bed, the sexual relationship, forget about all the other aspects of relationships, in bed, you, you may need to readjust your thinking about how to, how to deal with the your The old line, hard partner. line feminists hate the Viagra uh, epidemic, you know, they, and the porn epidemic. Porn tends to make women, make men, excuse me, view women as objects. You know, they're watching all these 20 year old girls all siliconed up and you're doing all kinds of crazy stuff that, you know, their wife doesn't seem to be doing. And all of a sudden, guys are objectifying women. That makes women hate men even more. So, I mean, some of these things are really seriously impacting relationships. Well, it sounds like it creates kind of a discomfort at some level and an anxiety. And uh, I, I suppose that some people would say, well, thank you, Brad, but I, I think I like the old model better. <laughs> <laughs> it, you know, I, I was predictable. I knew where it was going. I knew my role, and I'd really rather take that role. Um, it also, you know, opens to me the fact that you, you identified this on a geographical basis. You know, the U.S. and, for that matter, Europe, um, you know, these, these things have changed. There is a, gender, a pronounced gender gap in the processes. Um, but what about Asia? What about, you know, developing countries? Um, what about well, rural parts of what, America What and about Europe? this divide between the Muslims and the, and the Christians? Where, you know, Muslims, Religion, can have, right? Muslims can have four wives. I mean, how does that tie in with, you know, with the modern you know, liberated woman's view of, uh, of, of their ability to, you know, be equals in society. You know, maybe they can drive now in Saudi Arabia. That's, a, I suppose, a breakthrough. I mean, you know, it's, it's <laughs> like, you know, there are major, major gaps. You know, Asia, the more wealthy Asia gets, the less the, the, the idea of the old, you know, Chinese billionaire having four or five mistresses, you know, the raise the red ladder thing, that starts to decline a little bit in Asia. But Asia is still much more freewheeling than, than the West. And, and the Muslim and Arab countries are totally different. I mean, it's a, it's a whole different grid that people function on, and uh, it's going to be hard. To, it's going to be hard to bridge in America. You know, the, if guys can, you know, be more in tune with their sensitive female side, uh, you know, that's probably the best advice you can give somebody for here. And ironically, women get more dissatisfied with their lives as they age, and males get more satisfied with or without marriage. Guys are in their fifties are happier than their, than guys in their forties. They've traced that. Midlife, I've heard that midlife on crisis recently. and all that is, you know, that's, the, that's yeah. a, a male's time to be down on himself and be suicidal or whatever is, is in his 40s. In women, they, as, they, as they start to age out, they get less happy, although you would think that they would be maybe more happy. Maybe they've even achieved more, but they've, they've had more stress along the way. Self-image, uh, image of their own looks and beauty, whatnot. It's complicated, but let me say that. I'm, you know, I'm always amazed that what you do in terms of the matrimonial practice is really at the center of multiple intersections, and you've written it up in your book, and you talk about it and give talks, it's, and it's really right on the money. I mean, I'm not joking when I say you are a philosopher, Brad. Well, it, what's happened is it's, it's turned into, I mean, you know, family law, you know, it's turned into sociology, demographics, biology, there's all kinds of that stuff that starts to interweave. I mean, I've been a divorce lawyer for a long time. I run the biggest divorce firm in the state. And, um, you know, I've been, you know, we've probably done, we've probably done 30,000 divorces. I've probably personally done eight or 9,000 of them. You know, I got a little tired of just doing the meat ax down the middle kind of divorce law, and I kind of wanted to get more interested well, in what, you know, what goes behind very it. Very important that you've done that. Very important for any family law attorney. But it's also very important that all of us integrate what you're talking about. Thank you, Brad. Brad Coates, really appreciate you coming Always down. Always good to see you, Jay. Yeah, do it again soon, right? Okay. Good. Yeah.